The next part of our study of animals, we'll be talking about the body systems. And you have a packet with a schedule on here that tells you pretty much what we're going to be doing in class. Uh, there are some worksheets along the way. I will tell you what you need to do for which thing. Most of your notes can be taken in tables once again. Okay. So first of all, we're going to talk about levels of organization. There are five levels of organization. There's the cell level, which is muscle cell. The tissue level, which is a bunch of muscle cells together makes the muscle tissue. There's the organ level that is made of several different kinds of tissue put together. The organ system, which is several organs put together. And then the organism is made of many systems that function together. So those are the, those are the basic uh, uh, levels of organization in multicellular triploblastic animals. Uh, for vocabulary, this is what I'm doing in this unit. Right now, I've got the, this vocabulary in red with the definitions in purple. But what I'm doing in this unit is we're, we're grouping the body systems together into categories, and each category is going to be color-coded. The vocabulary words will be color-coded to that unit, and they're going to be underlined. The information that you need to write will still be in purple, and the other stuff that we'll discuss will be in black. So uh, this gives you the definitions of tissue, organ, and organ system that you could actually get from your book. I took them and kind of shortened them, made them a little bit more concise, but that's basically what you need to know about what a tissue, an organ, an organ system, and an organism are. There are four main kinds of tissues. There's epithelial tissue, which is coverings of surfaces and linings of, of, of organs and cavities like your skin is epithelial tissue. Connective tissue, which is uh, by definition a sparse population of cells within a, a non-cellular extracellular matrix, like if you think about bone, you've got bone cells surrounded by the calcium carbonate of the, or the calcium compounds of the bone. A muscle is a cell that contains molecules of proteins that can contract. And the nervous tissues uh, uh, sense stimuli and rapidly transmit information. This diagram shows you the different types of epithelial tissue. If you will turn to the second full page of your packet, there is a table about types of tissues, the functions you can put in the table. The cell types would be things like the squamous epithelium, which are flat cells, like the ones we saw in the lining of your mouth when we studied cells back last fall. We've got cuboidal epithelium, which makes up glands and, um, and organs the shape of a cube, and then columnar epithelium that has, that has column shaped. The different organ systems that you can find this in, of course, the uh, integumentary system, which is the skin, as well as the lungs, which is the respiratory system, the esophagus, which is the digestive system, as along with the um, intestine, and the um, excretory system in the kidney. So you'll find um, epithelial tissue in lots of different places in the body. The second kind of tissue, here's the connective tissue. So here are some, uh, the collagen fibers in the extracellular matrix in the loose connective tissue under your skin. We've got fibrous connective tissue forming a tendon from the muscle to the bone here. We've got adipose tissue, which is your subcutaneous fat layer for insulation. We have cartilage that is a type of connective tissue in the skeletal system. We've got bone, which is another kind of connective tissue in the skeletal system. And then we have blood, which is also a connective tissue because it's got the cells in the plasma. And it's, so it's considered a connective tissue as well. The um, third kind of tissue, muscle tissue, we have several, three different kinds of muscles that you find in, in, body, in humans. We have skeletal muscle, which is striated or striped and is under voluntary control, like your biceps here. We have cardiac muscle, which is striated as well as branched. That's found and has these joints in between, or junctions in between cells. It's found only in the heart. And we have smooth muscle that is non-striated muscle that is not voluntarily controlled. It's found in organs like the digestive system. And then finally, we have a nerve cell. This is a neuron. Uh, we will label a diagram of a neuron in class, and so this is just to show you the general structure that the neurons are pretty much the same throughout the body. So we have 12 body systems, and we're breaking those down into four categories. Those of regulation, nutrient absorption, reproduction, and then support and movement and defense from illness or injury. We've already discussed the uh, 
um, immune system quite extensively because we had a whole unit on it. So that's p taking part, care of part of this. But we will also talk about how the skin helps protect from uh, illness and injury as well as the support and movement. So we're going to color code these. The, again, the vocabulary is going to be underlined and what you need to write is in purple. And we're going to begin with the systems of regulation which are color coded in red. Here's a, some diagrams of the different uh, struct, different systems that show you the different systems we're going to talk about. You also have a page in your packet that has some descriptions of systems of the body and shows you the organs contained in each system. So you can also use that for reference as well. <clears throat> this shows some more of the systems and we're now going to begin talking about the systems of regulation. So the first one of the systems of regulation we'll discuss is the nervous system. The nervous system coordinates the body's activities, detects stimuli, integrates information, directs responses. Lots of different things going on there in the nervous system. Nerve cells function pretty much the same way throughout the animal kingdom. We'll talk a little bit about how nerve stimuli are transmitted when we do some of the worksheets in your packet. So in class we'll discuss that. Um, in animals as a whole, there is a variety of different ways that the nervous systems are encountered. In um, radially symmetrical animals like cnidarians, you have something called a nerve net. This is a series of interconnected neurons. There's no real brain, but there is an integration of the function of the nerves. Nerve stimulated in one part of the body can, be, can cause uh, changes in another part of the body. In animals with bilateral symmetry, of course, we generally have cephalization in those, the formation of a head region, and the centralization of nerve endings and sense organs at the anterior end or the head end of the body. Um, when we look at flatworms, we have the nerve cords that transmit the signals down the body. Um, same thing in other kinds of worms. Eventually, we see the development of a ventral nerve cord with ganglia and brains, like we see in the arthropods. And then finally, we see the centralized nervous system in vertebrates, the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and the sense organs all involved there. So the gradual increase in the complexity of the nervous system as we pass through from one group of animals to the next. The endocrine system is a second uh, system of, in, of regulation. Uh, it involves chemical signals to regulate body activities. This is mostly found in vertebrates. There are a few hormones in other kinds of, th in other kinds of animals, <coughs> like pheromones, that you find in insects and so forth. But we're going to deal mostly with what happens in, in, um, in vertebrates. A hormone, by definition, is a regulatory chemical that travels in the blood from where it's produced to a target cell that has receptors for that particular hormone and will be, and will be affected by that hormone. Some hormones also affect the nervous system. There is a lot of integration or interaction between the nervous system and the endocrine system. The, in, the nervous system has some control of the endocrine system and the endocrine system has communication with the nervous system to affect that control. <clears throat> something that we need to discuss quite extensively is something called negative feedback. This is because a lot of systems are controlled by pairs of hormones with opposite effects. And the whole idea behind this is to main, maintain homeostasis. Definition, a change in one thing triggers a response that counteracts the initial change. This is like, this works the same way that a thermostat works. When you set the thermostat to keep your house at a certain temperature in the summertime, the air conditioner will come on when the temperature goes above that temperature. If the, if the, temper, if the temperature is, uh, thermo, thermostat is set for 72 degrees and the temperature in the house raises to 73 degrees, it's going to cause the air conditioner to be turned on. The air conditioner will cool the house until the temperature falls below the set point, 72 degrees, and when it falls below 72 degrees, the air conditioner will turn off and it will stay turned off until the temperature goes above 72 degrees and then it will turn on again. This is negative feedback and hormone systems work the same way. Here's an example of a hormone system you have in your body to control your blood sugar levels. Okay, When you eat a carbohydrate rich meal, the carbohydrates 
the complex carbohydrates will be broken down in your digestive system into glucose. The glucose will then enter the bloodstream, will be absorbed by the bloodstream, and that's going to cause a rise in the blood glucose level. When the blood glucose level reaches a certain point, it turns on beta cells in the pancreas, and it stimulates them to release insulin into the blood. Insulin has two effects. It will cause the body cells to be able to take up more insulin and more glucose so they can use the glucose to power um, cellular respiration, to release ATP for the cells to use. It will also cause the liver to take up glucose and store it as glycogen. Glycogen is a form of starch that you find in animals. When, the, when those two, as, a, as, a, uh, as an effect of these two process is going on, the blood glucose level is going to decline. When it declines to a certain set point, that's going to create another stimulus to turn off the release of insulin. And the insulin release will stay off until either, until the blood sugar level rises again. Now let's say you go a long time without eating. What's going to happen to your blood, blood glucose level after a while is it's going to drop lower than that set point. And that's going to stimulate the, the alpha cells of the pancreas to release glucagon, which is another hormone. Glucagon stimulates the liver to take that glycogen and break it down and release glucose into the blood. And when that has the effect of raising the blood glucose level back up to that set point to maintain homeostasis. If it goes beyond that, then that will cause the release of insulin and so forth. It's a continuous process. People who have um, insulin-dependent diabetes ha or any kind of diabetes have a difficulty with this system. Either they don't make insulin or they don't make enough insulin, and that's why they have to be careful what they eat uh, to make and to take insulin shots or medication as needed to maintain their blood sugar at a healthy level. The third system of regulation is the excretory system. It's involved with osmoregulation, and that is the control of the uptake and loss of water and solutes. Okay? Now, in aquatic animals, the water control is going to focus on getting rid of excess water because they're going to take on extra water. In terrestrial animals, it's going to focus on preventing excess water loss. And the solute control is involved with sodium ions and nitrogen compounds. Both types of control depend on controlling excretion and the filtration of solutes from the blood. And there's a lot of diversity in excretory systems as well. We talked about animals that depend entirely on diffusion, those that have nephridia or gills or kidneys. And we're going to focus more on the kidney and how the kidney works. Now, different animals produce different kinds of nitrogen compounds as waste materials. Okay? They all are involved in using those amino groups, getting those amino groups for the breakdown of proteins. Okay? So with, if, whether we have proteins breaking down to amino acids, nucleic acids breaking down to nitrogen bases, we're going to get amino groups. Aqu most aquatic animals deal with that by producing ammonia as a waste product, and it's usually released from their gills, but some of it's filtered out by their kidneys. Mammals, and most amphibians and, and sharks and some bony fish, produce urea, which is a different kind of nitrogen compound that's filtered out by the kidneys. Birds and other reptiles and insects and land snails and things like that produce uric acid, but all three of these compounds are nitrogen compounds that can be harmful if they build up in the animal. And the kidneys take care of removing the nitrogen compounds as well as excess salts and maintaining the water balance in the animal. Uh, the kidney in the human involves the use of structures called nephrons, and the nephron is similar to the nephridia that we looked at in the um, earthworms and other animals like that. You have a capsule here that the, the blood is filtered and the filtration goes through the glomerulus there, and uh, the filtrate is pulled out and it, and it filters out water and other small molecules. Some of the molecules are reabsorbed, some things are secreted back into the filtrate, and then the final filtrate is turned into urine and is excreted from the body. We'll go over the diagrams in class. There's a, there's a worksheet on the nephron, and there are some worksheets also that we'll do on, on nerve cells in class. This concludes this set of notes about systems regulation.